Good morning. If you'll stand and turn your hymnals to 549, 549. You'll turn to the inside of your pamphlet. We'll read the call to worship as responsive reading. God of grace, we come with all we have. Body, soul, mind, all to you. We have come for a glimpse of your kingdom of kindness. The world where love rules over all. The world where enemies embrace. Distinctions between friends and foe evaporating in the light of your love. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your house this morning. We ask that you would bless this time of worship and that you would challenge each and every one of our hearts, God. And may we leave this place different. God, we pray for those who can't be here with us this morning. We ask that you would minister to them wherever they are, God, and whatever is going on in their lives. May they just feel your grace, your mercy, and your peace in this moment. And God, we take the time to stop and to pray the prayer that you taught the disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for this opportunity to come into your house and to come boldly before your throne and to make our requests known. But first and foremost, we want to just take a moment, God, and appreciate the prayers that you've already answered. And God, we now bring before you some of our needs. And we first and foremost, we think about all those that are not here with us this morning, God, whether they be sick or traveling. And those traveling, God, we ask for your traveling mercies, for your protection, that you keep them safe on the roads and that they would... Come back safely, God, and we could all worship together and we ask that you just be with them and minister to them. We pray for the preschool, God. We ask that you would uh, be with them, God, that you would minister to everything that's going on in that situation. You know the needs, you know the ins and outs, the ups and downs of that preschool. And so we ask that you would minister to it, that you would be there, God, and that you would allow them, God, to show your light to these children and to their parents. But we also pray for the unspoken, God. You know every detail of those unspoken requests and you know exactly what's going on and so I ask that you would come, that you would administer your peace and that your will would be done in each and every situation. Finally, God, we pray for the remainder of this service and we ask that you would bless it, that you would minister to it and God, that we would uh, be a sweet smelling savor of our worship in your nose in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.
this time we'll take up our offering. opportunity to worship you through our giving and we ask that you would take our gifts and make them meet the needs of this church and go above and beyond in Jesus name amen
The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant <coughs> went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred dinner. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knee and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went, <clears throat> he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you paid me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I have on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all the world. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Now let's turn to page. The hymn notes are placed on uh, page 633. looking at really a tough parable. I've titled this sermon simply Forgiveness. Now, all week long, every time I went to study, I meant to look up who said this next quote, and I kept forgetting to look it up. I can't tell you who said this next quote, but bitterness and unforgiveness is the poison we drink thinking we're hurting the other person. So hopefully by next Sunday I'll remember to look that up and tell you who said that. I did not make that up. But I don't know who, quoted, who wrote that. But I'll say it one more time. Bitterness and unforgiveness is the poison we drink thinking we're hurting the other person. This morning I want to talk a little bit about forgiveness. And it's interesting, depending on what, which scholar you look at and which uh, version of the Bible you read, how this interprets on a few things. Some say, when Peter came to Jesus, said, how many times should I forgive my brother? You know, seven times. Some say 70 times 7, some say 77, so it's kind of disputed there. I think the main point there is simply this. 
you've got to forgive so many times you lost track of count. Yeah, it's hard to go like, well, this is the 23rd time I've forgiven this person. I think I got, and I should have done the math before I did that, 50, uh, 40, uh, 47 more times. No, plus 7, so 50 more times. Right? It gets frustrating. The point is, is that you're not supposed to count how many times you forgave somebody. You're supposed to continue to forgive them. But it's not always easy. Right? Forgiving people is... is is difficult because there's always this side where we want to show we're right. If you look at the chapter before this, you've got where Jesus was talking to them in the beginning. You know, he says, you know, who's greatest in heaven? And he puts a child in front of them. Oh, you want to know who's greatest in heaven? It's a child. Why, why are childs so great? Because they have no real ill will and no real memory, right? A kid, one moment, they could, they could be in a little fight over a toy, they settle it out, they're fine, and they continue playing. They're still friends. You become adults, you have one little disagreement about politics, and you don't talk to the person anymore. Right? I mean, it doesn't have to be politics, but that's typically one of your big ones. Religion, politics, you're not supposed to talk about those on your first date, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> the point is, is that we get upset, and we're like, we just shut people out. Like, we're incapable of looking at someone and saying, oh, they have a different opinion. My dad used to tell us growing up that opinions are like armpits. Everyone's got one, and everyone else's stinks. <laughs> I cleaned that up a little bit. <laughs> My dad's from the military. He uses a different thing, but you think what else stinks in the human body and figure it out for yourself. The point is, is that, like, we're very intolerant. Right? And it's, it's a difficult balance. I'll admit to you it's a difficult balance because the reality is what we are and what we have is we're right. Right? We have Jesus Christ, the one true God. we got God Almighty, the one who created the heavens and the earth. So we're right. But do we have to disrespect and hate on people that think differently? Or can we love them into the kingdom? When somebody hurts us and somebody does wrong against us, should we just be like, well, they're a loss, I'm a better person, I got Jesus, or should we forgive them? And should we forgive them so many times we lose count? Let's look at this a little bit. So Jesus says, after he tells them 77 times, or 7 times 70, whatever you want to look at that as, just an in number, you know, he's un 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 easy to count to number. Jesus says, therefore the kingdom of heaven. Right? So what's he talking about? He's talking about this is, this is me and my Father, and this is the way the kingdom of heaven works, and so pay attention. And he says, it's like a king who decides to settle his debts. So you come to that point in time, we'll say every month, when you've got all your different debts, you have to pay, right? If you don't pay the mortgage, they're going to take it away. If you don't pay for the car, they'll come and they'll tow that away. You gotta pay up your debts. So the king says, let's, uh, let's have people pay their debts. The first person that comes to him is actually a pretty wealthy person to have this much debt. That or it was a crazy, foolish king. But I'm gonna go with wealthy, because this is supposed to be like king of heaven, and I don't think that God is foolish. So if you look at this, and what we read this morning, and because I unfortunately didn't type off NIV, so I have to go back over here. Uh, it says that he owed 10,000 talents. The version I have says 10,000 bags of gold. My favorite version, which is the NLT, because I had professors that worked on the translations, so that's why I like it, um, says uh, that he owed him millions. So he had a lot of debt. And the king just doesn't loan you millions. So what does this guy do? He comes before, and the king says, hey, it's time to pay up. If you borrowed millions, I'd like to think you should have a couple dollars, right? Most people are, you know, when they say, oh, can I borrow money, you know, I'll pay you back. But what do you have to pay me back? You know, I went for my first house loan two and a half years ago. I was shocked at the things they wanted to know and the things they pulled up. If you stole a piece of bubble gum when you were five years old, it's on your record. Don't ask me how. The police didn't arrest me. I don't know how they figured this stuff out. I even asked them. I was like, how do you know that? Like, where does this stuff come from? I was five years old. My mother made me buy five pieces of candy and leave them at the counter 
I'll never forget it. I haven't stolen since because I didn't want to pay five things I wasn't going to get. But they look at everything. They don't just hand you money. They don't just say, oh, you look like a good person. Or you're funny. You told a good joke. Here, here's, here's a couple million dollars. This guy comes before the king, and he sees, the king says, all right, that's it. I'm going to have you... Uh, I'm going to have you and your wife and your children all sold to repay the debt. Imagine that. You're standing before the king, and the king says to you, you know what? I'm going to sell you. I'm going to sell your wife. I'm going to sell your children. And then the debt will be even. Oh, well. So you, you can look at that. You can think, how on earth is that possible? You're going to sell away somebody? You're going to screw this up like that? Really? So what does the guy do? He does what any good, respectful person would do. He gets down on his knees and begs for mercy. We don't know because Jesus doesn't tell us, but my guess is he started out with, sell me to save my children and my wife. We don't know. That's just the way I would think. In the end, whatever he said, the king said, you know what? I forgive you. Go in peace. Now, if that was me, I would be running home, skipping, jumping, cartwheeling. Honey, you won't believe it. We're debt free. We were millions of dollars in debt. We're debt free. <laughs> this is crazy. Imagine. Some of you probably can't imagine being that many millions in debt, but you'd be feeling pretty good. Not this guy, though. What does this guy do? He turns around and he goes and hits up somebody that in the, in the, the version we read this morning says um, he owed 100 denarii. In mine, it says uh, he owed him 100 silver coins. And in the NLT, it says a few thousand dollars. So think about that. Millions, a few thousand. You've just been forgiven millions. Let's make it a little bit easier. You just found out from the bank that your loan is paid off and it doesn't matter. You don't ever have to pay another mortgage payment. And the government decided you've paid enough property tax that so you don't have to pay taxes anymore on your house. Okay, it's unrealistic, but remember millions. We're talking millions here. Not many of us are rolling in the millions. And I'm not either, so don't, I don't get any ideas. Everything's forgiven. You own everything outright. From here on out, when you work, it's pure profit. And you turn around, and you say to that person that you loaned a hundred bucks, and you said, hey, pay up the hundred bucks. The king's forgiven me, but I'm not the king in your pain. But it gets worse. You end up in a domestic dispute. The Bible says that he started to choke the man. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me. His fellow servant did the same thing he did. He fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me. I will pay it back. But he refused and instead he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Now prison back then was a little bit different than what we're thinking prison. Okay, if you had a debt, if somebody owed you a debt, you could actually stick them. The easiest way I'll explain it is a chain gang. So basically the prison was they were going to work and they wouldn't get paid and you would get the money for everything they did. So basically he was selling the guy into slavery to get his debt paid. Why they had this system, I don't know. I don't fully really understand it, but that's, that's what's happening. So he throws this guy in this situation. Over a few hundred bucks. Imagine. You've been forgiven everything. You go and you stick it to this guy. There's a little, a little caveat here that we have to think about. A little thing that happened a few chapters earlier. Matthew chapter 7. So first, a lot of us don't like to read the whole thing. Listen very, very closely. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge 
others. You will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Think about that. We often stop at judge not that you won't be judged. But Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 takes a little further. He says, listen, when you judge someone else, that measure, that standard you use, that's the one that's going to be used against you. So what ends up happening? A couple of the servants see this, and they say, this isn't right. We're going to go before the king. What's the king do? He calls them the servants. And he says, you wicked servant, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Ready for the tough verse? This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. That's a tough verse. So if I hold unforgiveness, that's the way God's going to treat me? Let me talk to you about the millions. Jesus Christ died on a cross for us. Our entire debt was paid. On our best day, on our best year, on our best decade, we could not pay the debt that we owe for what he did. Think about that. He came here, he lived a perfect life. Well, that just cut out every one of us. But let's just say maybe a few of you are this close to birth. You're still up. But we'll, we'll, we'll let you keep going. After all that, you get to this place where you have to sacrifice. Because if you look at the, the Old Testament and the way it worked, the forgiveness of sin was through the sacrifice of a perfect man. Are you ready to say, okay, I'll sacrifice myself. Let's not say the whole world. Maybe just your family. Let's not forget that aunt or uncle that drives you nuts. The cousin that's always asking for money and you've never been paid back. The sibling that, yeah. You ready to die for them too? Now Jesus did it for the whole world. I'm only asking you to do it for your family. And you ready for this? You agree to it. Let's just say you agree to it. And your family then puts you through the ringer. Beats you laughs at you, you're an idiot, why are you doing this? Then they mock you. I preached a sermon a long time ago. I honestly thought I wasn't going to get the internship. It was my, I was a freshman in college. I was out in uh, Worcester, Ohio, near Akron, where LeBron's from. It's a little bit different out there. And I, I didn't think I used a bad word, but I, I said the word hell. I guess in the wrong context, the whole church gasped. But what I said was this. I said, imagine you on the cross, right? It was me. The first time somebody said to me, if you be the Christ, come down from there. Oh, I would have come down and slapped them. Think about this. Jesus Christ had the power to call 10,000 angels and destroy the world. Are you ready in that moment when you know you've got the power to be like, you know what, forget it. I don't need to die for you. I don't need to pay this debt for you. I don't need to forgive you. Would you still do it? What did Jesus say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Did you ever think about the fact that people that nailed Jesus to the cross were forgiven? I'm not as bad as that guy. Are you sure you're not as bad as that guy? When I was in college, 
We won our, our, we went to regionals for the first time in 18 years of being in the school, or the school, the first time in 18 years of the school. Somehow I always ended up being the cook whenever we had group meetings. It's freezing cold because we're talking, it's close to December, it's about the end of the semester. We lost in the second round, unfortunately, but it was the first time we'd even made it to regionals in 18 years. I'm standing out in a strange part of Philadelphia. There I am and I'm, I'm cooking and all the guys are inside playing FIFA, which is a soccer video game. I don't play video games anyway, so it didn't really bother me. And I look up and there's a rather large man and he's very, very agitated. And he's only in a t-shirt. I'm talking, it's freezing. There's snow on the ground. We're in the, we'll say the 20s. And I'm thinking to myself, oh boy, this isn't gonna end well. We're in a rough section of Philly. This guy's agitated. I mean, we're talking ready to punch somebody. And it was obvious. So the guy comes down towards me and I feel like in my heart, offer him a hot dog. I was like, really? You want me to talk to this guy? <laughs> He's kind of pissed off. Like, this isn't a good idea. So I'm thinking, well, you know what? At least if I offer him some food, he won't punch me. So I said, hey, you want a hot dog? You want a hamburger? He's like, no. You got a funny accent. Where are you from? I was like, well, that's not a good start, but OK. So I was like, Boston, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm studying psychology. Partially true. I didn't want to get hit. I didn't want to tell the guy I was there for theology. I was embarrassed. Probably mostly because I was young. But either way, I remember all of a sudden in my heart, I felt like, really? You're going to deny me like that? I'm giving you an opportunity. You're going to deny me? It was the moment. It was the second time it happened in my life. That was the first time in my life where I realized, wow. Had I been there, I would have stuck him on the cross, too. You know what happened? The guy says to me, I stop. I said, you know what? That's only half truth. I'm actually here studying theology and psychology. I said, I have a double major. He goes, what are you going to do with that? I said, well, honestly, as a kid, a lot of people in the church didn't give me a chance. So my goal is to give everybody I ever meet a chance and an opportunity. He goes, I think we grew up in the same church. I said, really? He goes, yeah, I got kicked out when I was 17 because I got my girlfriend pregnant and told me I don't have a chance to go on I was ready to run from the guy when I first saw him. I ended up having an opportunity to stand there, pray with him. This big, big, agitated man was crying. They never let me see my girlfriend again. I don't know what happened to the baby. 35 years old, the kid would be uh, 18, right? 17, yeah, 18. Here I was, ready just to save myself. Don't get hit. And God had a guy that needed some love. I was ready to deny Christ. You know, every time we don't forgive somebody, Every time we hold something against them, we're denying God. We're saying all the things that you forgave me for, thanks, appreciate it, I'm on my way to heaven, you owe me. What did the master say, right? What did the king say? You wicked servant. After everything I did for you, you begged me and I gave you Forgiveness. I took away your whole debt. You couldn't forgive someone else? Go back to the start. 77 or 7 times 70, the amount of times we're supposed to forgive somebody. What is God saying to you? Stop counting. The number's too high to count. The right answer is forgive them. Love them. It's not easy. Right? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, it says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. We've been given the best 
possible gift in the world. And instead of emulating that and re-giving that to others, we just want the forgiveness for ourselves and the rest of the world can have my cold shoulder unless I like it. I stole this next part from another pastor, but I really liked it, and I wrote it down years and years ago, so I'm going to use it again. Forgiveness is like buying a house. There's this big upfront payment, and then you've got to make the monthly payment over and over and over and over again. The average person, somewhere between 22 and 30 years later, they own your house outright. Sometimes when we forgive somebody, there's the upfront difficult part. You gotta go to somebody. Whether you're right or wrong, it's not what the Bible doesn't say. Jesus never says if you actually borrow the money or if you actually deserve to be right or if you actually are wrong, just to forgive one another. So you gotta go and humble yourself and ask for that forgiveness. Do you know what I found? I gotta make sure I continue to forgive that person. Because just like if you don't make your house payments, you can have the house foreclosed on and lose the house. If you don't continue to forgive that person, the bitterness can come back in, the pain can come back in, and the only person you're hurting when that happens is yourself. You know what I found shocking? One of the first times I started asking people forgiveness, they didn't even know I was mad. They didn't. Here I am, I'm hurting, I'm angry, I'm steaming, I'm day after day. Actually, years ago when something horrible happened, I was three years frustrated, depressed. I remember asking God, God, why do you let their lives continue? They're the ones who hurt me. How come I can't have something good? How come all this evil came out of this and, and yet they're living their lives like everything's okay? You know what happened when I forgave them? My eyes opened. My life was pretty good. Honestly, it was. You know what the craziest thing is? One of the people that I had to go to, they couldn't believe it. He looked at me and he said, are you kidding me? I wish I had your life. You've got everything. He goes, I just look like I have everything. He says, if you only knew what it was like for me to go home every day, you wouldn't go home. I was like, wow. Here I am, eating myself up, destroying me. And this poor person needed some love. They just needed somebody to say, I forgive you. You want to go get a coffee? Can I help you? You want me to take the kids for an hour so you can have some alone time? You don't know what's going on in someone else's life. But I can tell you this, the longer you hold on forgiveness, the harder it is. Remember, go to that last verse. This is a tough verse in the Bible. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister. Remember Matthew chapter 7. The same measure you judge others with, God's going to judge you. You really ready for that? You really okay with that idea? This morning I'll leave you with the challenge. I'll forgive people. I'm not saying put yourself in harm's way. It's not what I'm saying. You don't go play with a rattlesnake. Have respect the rattlesnake. Don't hate the rattlesnake. When he dies, you take the rattle off and give it to your kid as a toy. It's not all that. There's always a positive thing in every situation. Forgive. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to look at this parable. We ask God that you would challenge each and every one of our hearts. God, may we be quick to forgive. In the areas, God, where we've held bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness against anyone. 
I ask that you would have mercy on us. Give us the strength to humble ourselves, to go before them and make that first down payment. And God, then I ask for the strength to continue to forgive them. Because the last thing we want to do is stand before you at the end of our time, knowing we didn't forgive somebody, and you're going to treat that same unforgiveness towards us. How horrible. God, we beg for your mercy this morning. And I ask God in any way that anyone in here may be struggling with forgiveness, I ask that you would minister to them this morning. Give them strength. Give them peace. And challenge their hearts. Let go. And let God. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand with me and turn in your hymnal to 334. 334. Thank you.